polish them. Uh, I wanted to share with you our experience uh, on some other issue on research data, which was already mentioned today in our keynote speeches, and it's on our journey towards open science. Um, so briefly, agenda, what, what points or what issues I'm going to touch today. The alarm is uh, ringing after 12 minutes, or? So I hope. Well, we I won't be making the alarm years after 12. <laughs> so why research data? And just to give you briefly some famous quotes, actually. Um, there's a, a lot, a huge number of documents uh, we use when we talk about research data, but just to show the idea isn't new anymore. So it's at least, at least 15 years old. An idea saying that research data and access to especially publicly funded research data should be granted for the public, which might be criticized again. But um, the idea lives still, and some even say the data is the new oil in, in our research, in uh, new research century, especially in the European research area. And more important, it results in formal requirements as the recent open research data pilot in Paris in 2020. What is the institutional role in opening or granting the access for research data? So again, some, some famous documents. This one is from the Royal Society, published in 2012. Um, well, they define the roles, I should say, of, of institutions very broadly. And and actually, the first one is the most difficult one, as I would say. It's about the recognition and, and providing the researchers who do share their data. So it, it still has to come to our minds, probably, so we recognize not only the publications and journal impact factors, but also making available the data they are working on. And what a lot of universities are starting to do at the moment is the second one, is developing their own strategy and their own action plan, how do they tackle this, this issue. It, it, it's, all, it's also the thing the Humboldt University is doing now, and um, my role in that is the coordinator, so to coordinate this uh, initiative at Humboldt University. And as a result, we all should have this open data mindset, I would say, in this culture, where access to data is provided and, and recognized. Um, second um, new document, actually, it, it comes from the League of European Research Universities. Um, they um, touch a lot of a lot of important things in this in this uh, paragraph here. So the important is um, they speak of infrastructure in terms of technical infrastructure and human infrastructure. So we need staff and skills. Um, and people who support and enable uh, data sharing and open uh, data. Uh, they also um, point to a very important thing, the driving cultural change, which might be even more difficult than building technical infrastructure. So it's, it's important to keep it, keep it uh, in mind that the cultural change is still needed. Uh, so what we did at the Humboldt University, this uh, dedicated job position is in place since August 2012. Um, the initial task was to develop an, a constitu an institutional concept for research data management. So what should the university as a higher education institution do? What is its role? And the second task would be to implement this concept. Um, starting points were all these questions. We had no answers to these questions, so we started to answer these questions. So, because if we want to deliver some RTM services, we first need to know who, who are customers in the sense and what data do they have, how big they are, what types they are. So just, just to have a brief overview and no one had it before. And we focused on organizational, social, cultural, and legal aspects instead of just building a technical infrastructure. So if you would ask me why, there was also one famous publication titled um, If we build it, will they come? Cameron will know this. So again, there is a lot of repositories already in place which enable making data openly available. For example, the Zenoda, again mentioned in the keynote today, 
but uh, they're not so much used by the researchers and we wanted to know why and, and how can we enforce this. What we did, um, first because the survey, which is at the moment already one year old, it, um, we asked our researchers with our academic staff what kinds of data do they work with, uh, what, if they produce this data or they use this data, uh, how big it is and uh, what archiving or publishing presses are in place. Uh, and so on. And basically uh, on this results, we developed our institutional RDM policy and supporting guidelines. These two documents are already in the process to be passed by the official body of the university, the Academic Senate, and that it will result in an, an official, official document. And um, the last thing is uh, the roadmap for RDM services. It was based on gap analysis, so we just mapped what services do our researchers need with what services are currently in place and what do we have to do to meet this emergency gap. Um, this question is one of 24 questions we had in our survey. It was one of the most controversial questions <coughs> and issues, I have to say. So um, the researchers, the respondents of the survey, they were asking if they do take the role of good scientific practice into account. Um, the term of good scientific practice is uh, pretty typical for German universities. It um, comes originally from German Research Foundation and it was passed already in 1998, so again, a lot of years ago. And we asked our researchers, uh, it asked researchers if they do preserve the data underlying publications for at least 10 years as the policy requires. As you see, only approximately half of respondents say that yes, I do this like the policy requires. And uh, here you can see some issues. So why is it so how it is? So the important organizational thing is this 10 years period. Uh, a lot of job contracts or um, research projects are shorter than 10 years. 10 years. So again, it shows institutional role and it's necessary to do something on central archive also. Um, interesting thing was uh, the pro pro problematic notion of data in arts and humanities. A lot of respondents were answering like, uh, I do not work with data, uh, so this policy doesn't apply in my field, so they just ignore it. And um, we also did a comparison of results uh, between researchers and PhD students against, um, uh, compared with professors, and there we just wanted to take a look, are there any differences in DPS and what differences? And then we also observed uh, that younger researchers, they are um, very um, they are very unaware of such policies. That might be because of senior researchers have more responsibility for complying with policies. But again, it indicates um, there might be more effective communication to this group. And uh, as you can see, that our results are published on Zenodo. It's freely available, so if you just uh, look for it on Zenodo, you'll find two versions in, in German and in English. This comparison and the, and the summary of the results. Um, this one, this question was one of most interesting for us in, in terms of developing research data management services. We asked our researchers what kind of services they would wish to have at the Humboldt University. And they had very strong top three positions. The first one, the strongest one, um, uh, this one, the secure and backup storage for my data. Because each, every researcher um, tells me the amounts of data and the volume it is growing and there's no discipline where data is getting uh, smaller. So the, this data, the rouge term again, so they need backed up and secured uh, place for the data they can trust. The second one was um, this one, advising guidance and legal issues. Um, it's also about copyright and it's also about data privacy and, and some sense about how, how to deal with sensible data. It's important because if researchers are not sure if they're allowed to do something, they will probably not, just not to get some troubles after that. So, it's also very important, basic issue actually. 
And the third one was advice and guidance on technical issues, for example, metadata standards and long-term preservation, it was the yellow one. Um, that would be a task for our library, for example, together with our other um, university bodies. So if researchers are interested in, for example, archiving data for 10 years, they also need an advice which data format will be better suitable for them, for example. Um, and now, shortly, what lessons we learned by doing that and doing this one and a half years already. So what does it mean to provide or to establish an, an institutional RTM service? It's actually a journey of constant learning, I would say, because we al always have to bring different views together. It, it's not only about different disciplines. As universities, they have a lot of disciplines at the as an institution, there is no university which has only one discipline. So there are some different views between disciplines and again between stakeholders. And so we always need to have, um, we need to find the right balance between these different views. So again, it's about local setting of the institution itself and the global questions our researchers are working on, or generic and discipline specific needs, and so forth. So researchers, um, they need pragmatic support and they are of course very happy if we can make their life easier. So they surely are happy to have such services as for example the top three services first. Um, again without broad academic recognition, um, this all work on making data available and describing it uh, in order so <coughs> Thank you for your attention.